if you're about ready to go, um, the session is being recorded and I'll continue to let people in. Um, feel free to just ignore that doorbell sound that you will keep hearing and I'll take care of that, okay? Great, thank you. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Anna Rozelle and I'm one of the library faculty here at Phoenix College. And I am going to, and thank you for being here. I should, I should say that. So thank, thanks, for, thanks for coming. It's, it's wonderful to see all of you here. I'm gonna be going through my presentation without stopping. So as I'm speaking, if you have a question or you wanna share a comment, please do so in the chat. And Jenny will be monitoring the chat for me. On this first slide, what you're seeing here are limitations and risks associated with generative AI and large language models. I'm actually not gonna be talking about this today, but rest assured, we will be having conversations about this. And in fact, next week, Amy Mack is hosting two AI happy hours where I'm sure some of these issues will come up. Instead, my focus, as Jenny mentioned, is how will AI tools impact research? And what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be sharing some AI tools all at the beta stage to get us to sort of stimulate our imagination of how research might evolve. I'm gonna be sharing screenshots. So this is gonna be a relatively fast paced presentation, but don't worry about the details. Just keep in mind this one question, how will AI tools impact research? It might impact the literature review. And the tool I'm gonna to show you is called Elicit. And what Elicit tries to do is it tries to pull the most useful papers for a lit review from the semantic scholar database. You can see up at the top, that's my research question, my prompt. How will CECs affect fish and wildlife? This is an actual real question based on a PC cure that we had on our campus. So I, I put in that question, I prompt, and I get this page, and I know it's hard to see, so I'm gonna show you. I get three different columns, and let me just show you them blown up. So on the left-hand side, it's trying to answer my question. It's giving me a summary based on research papers. And notice that the AI, I did not have to tell AI what CEC stood for, Contaminants of Emerging Concern. And then in the middle column, I get the list of the papers, the list of the articles. And then on the right-hand side, I get an AI-generated article headline, a, a sort of the main idea of each of those articles. If I picked an actual article in the middle, the AI provides more extracted data about that article for me. And I just blew up an example to show you that it's showing how other people have cited this article. It also provides the DOI, which is that unique identifying number. And with that number, you can find the full text of the article. So, and I said, you know, let's use our imagination today. So imagine that we have a CURE student who's about to go out into the field or is about to do an experiment and doesn't have any context, doesn't really, doesn't have any background on this research topic. So they use Elicit to get a sort of a selective literature review, some summary statements, and then they can take that DOI, put that unique number into one search off of our PC Library's homepage and find the full text of the article. Elicit also has a function of brainstorming research questions. And I got this idea from a colleague of mine at Scottsdale, uh, Serena Rock, and she practiced this with, in actually with a class. And she starts off with the class having a rich conversation about what makes a good research question. And then she has the students go into Elicit and put in their topic, and then they get some suggested research questions. And then she asks them to critique them. So she's asking them to think more deeply about research questions. The prompt I have here, domestic violence, Hispanic women, that was a topic that I was actually working with a nursing student on. And they did not know where to go. They, they were lost about where, what research questions should they explore. So I think this could have helped us in our conversation together. What's interesting about the suggested research questions is the first one isn't any good, but that would have been an interesting conversation. So the first one says, what is the prevalence of domestic violence among Hispanic women in the US? Well, you know, a simple statistic you can get from the CDC doesn't make for an interesting research project, but some of the other ones are pretty good. What are the barriers to seeking help for domestic violence among Hispanic women? I could have seen working with that nursing student to probably ultimately get to what can nurses do to eliminate barriers to seeking help for domestic violence. 
The next set of tools I want to share with you are summarization tools, and I'm going to show ScholarC and ChatGPT. ScholarC is a browser extension, and so what you're seeing here is a scholarly article about CECs from Science Direct, one of our library databases. And then I've launched ScholarC, I've launched that browser extension. And it's giving in that little white box, it's giving, giving a summary, sort of a conclusion about what this paper is all about. And then ScholarC gives a bunch of flashcards. And so I just grabbed a couple so you can see what it looks like. Key concepts, a synopsis, a little ethics statement. With ScholarC, there is a free version and you can do this kind of analysis with flashcards for three articles a day. Here's what the chat GPT summarizer looks like. So my prompt here is summarize, and then I put the URL for an EPA report on CECs, and it gives a little summary. Let me stop here just for a second and, and share with you. We have a colleague, Christine Skeen in English, who tested this out, who has experimented this with her ESL students. And she used this to help them read Newzilla articles. What's great is she used a second prompt after getting the summary where you ask, hey, can you identify some vocabulary words from that article that would be good for students to know? And please provide definitions for each one. So as I'm thinking about these tools, you know, I know one thing that students struggle with is reading those long scholarly articles. But we want them to engage with that information. That's our expert information. So possibly these summarization tools could help us get students to, inter, you know, to engage with this more complex information. There's also video summarizers. And my example here is YouTube Digest. It's using ChatGPT to summarize YouTube videos, and you can specify how you want that to be presented. And in my case here, I asked for bulleted points. This was a very long video about CECs, just packed full of research. It's over an hour long. But with the little summaries, I get little summaries, and this might help a student be more inclined to engage with a more academic, longer video. It also could help the student identify which part of the video should I go to that more directly aligns with my research question. AI is also very good at giving simple explanations, and I'm going to demonstrate this with Bing AI. And I first saw these prompts from a colleague of mine, Mary Ellen Bates, who's a librarian, and she's also a super searcher. And so you can see the prompts here. I'm asking for an explanation at a simple level. So this was actually a real case. I went to a conference and a company there was describing their AI product and they kept saying that they took an ontological approach. And honestly, I did not understand what that was. So I thought, I'm gonna ask Bing AI, what is an ontological approach to creating conversational AI? And it gave me an answer and you notice with Bing AI, it does provide some footnotes telling me where it got the, the answer. And these were actually really good. I went to all of them. You can see like number two is that standards and technology government agency. Number three, semantic scholar, that's that large database of academic research papers. So that was that those were sort of interesting to see. But honestly, the answer didn't help me because I still didn't understand. So I followed up with, hey, can you explain this to me at a simple middle school level? Sure enough, yes, and this helped me. So it said, an ontology is like a map that shows how different things are related. And then it said, for example, if you're interested in creating an AI, an AI system that'll help with your homework. So the example and the simple language actually helped me to understand that. Right now, what happens with students is it's difficult for them to get started if they don't have some background information on some of the key concepts related to their research question or the research topic. And so what, the, what we see them doing is they use Wikipedia for that. So I'm sort of imagining that maybe these AI tools could also be part of that search strategy for them to get some basic understanding so that they can get started. And getting started is a huge obstacle for our students. So, and there's actually research to support this. College students report out that getting started is the biggest challenge to doing research. 
since AI is very good at, at extracting data, extracting information, I thought, well, what if we use an AI tool to help students get started? And so I asked JetGPT, and these prompts here, those were the ones that JetGPT recommended for me. I said, can you provide some prompts that can help me get started on my research topic? And so here were some examples. And so I tried this one. I said, show me reliable sources for teaching about misinformation. And, and I did this on purpose because I have background in that. And so I could check to see, you know, how, how is the list? And so it showed six sources and they were all really quite good. And so they talked about free resources, free lesson plans. They explained the educational level, it's really helpful. And in fact, what's kind of nice with ChatGPT is that you can type the word continue and then it'll show you another list. So I got another list of six very, very good sites. So imagine a student using this. So you could possibly, I'm just thinking like designing a new type of research activity. You could have them show me reliable sources on the top that interest them. And then they check those sources out and they're checking the AI. So you could ask them, are these sites reliable? If so, why? Why are you saying that? What do they have in common? Was there another website that you found that was better? So I like that because you're validating their opinions and their, their critical thinking. They're not just, you're not just saying write a, you know, a two-page essay about this topic and cite a few websites. They're actually really critically thinking about these websites. So that's, you know, a possibility that you might be able to incorporate that in. Oh, this is interesting. I shared this with um, a friend and, and they said, hey, can't you just do that in Google? Like, why use AI for that? So I was like, hmm, I don't know. So I did a Google search with that ex exact same prompt. And I was surprised how bad <laughs> it was. It didn't do nearly as good a, of a search. So there was very little overlap with those very good quality sites that um, the AI got for me. I instead, it was like a mishmash. So instead, I know this might be hard to read, but on the top four, it mentioned Snopes, which is that one, like if you have an urban legend or a hoax, you can go to check. There was something called Cyberry Man. I've never heard of that. I went to that site. It was a very old school design site. And then there were some articles talking about the challenges that we as instructors have dealing with misinformation. It was only down near the end where it was like, oh yeah, there was like one possibly good example or two. So in this particular case, AI did better. Since I have mentioned Google, I have to mention Google also has a chatbot AI. It's called Bard. And you can see up at the top, my prompt is um, very similar to what I used in the other tool. Um, the sites, there's some overlap here, but also some new sites got pulled up. What's kind of nifty about Bard is you can easily toggle to different answers. So that if you can see draft one, draft two, draft three, if you're not happy with what you got in draft one, check out draft two and, and draft three. I wanted to show two tools that you might not have heard about before, perplexity AI and consensus. And you can see my examples of prompts to use there. I've been thinking about that maybe these AI, uh, these AI tools could be impacting research in terms of helping us identify new research questions to explore or sources to help us dig a little bit deeper. And here's what perplexity AI looks like. I used the same research question that I got from Ulysses about the barriers to seeking help for domestic violence among Hispanic women, and it gave me a brief answer. I could have actually expanded it to get a more detailed answer, but then it also did a couple of other things. It provided other research questions. So I think that's kind of interesting just in terms of like brainstorming research questions. You know, what other things might I be interested in? And then it also as we saw with Bing AI, it also lists sources. In this case, if the student had picked that JSTOR source, they would get this page that said, hey, here's a preview, but in order to read the full text article, you're gonna to need to use the library databases. This is what consensus looks like. And consensus has a mission to, to, to share expert knowledge 
to everyone. So, you know, a, a lot of this information is sort of locked down in library databases. So they have this mission to expose expert knowledge to all of us. It's a great mission. And they accept research questions. So I put a research question in there. Can St. John's Ward effectively treat severe depression? And I'm using that example because we have many biology students here who do medicinal plant research. And so I put in the question, and then what consensus tries to do is it tries to find the answers, relevant answers in research papers. And then it also tries to synthesize, and that's that little summary statement we have, an answer to that question. And so the sort of the synthesis is like, well, St. John's Ward is effective for mild, but for severe, probably not so much. So that was sort of the synthesis of it. And then you can see there's also a little consensus meter. So again, if we wanted to sort of shake up the way we ask students to do research, you know, instead of asking a biology student to say, hey, write a three page paper about St. John's, you know, ward uh, depression, if, where they're just regurgitating what they find on a couple of websites, you could, you could ask them to think more critically. So what I'm thinking about here is you have them start here. Then they, they go into a couple of the full text articles here to confirm, right, that's important with AI, to confirm that AI's summary of the article was correct, and then ask them, what's the evidence in the paper that was used to make that summary statement, that the author made that summary statement? And then I would follow it up with, find one more article from a very current, just within the last year, and tell us where that article fits on the consensus meter. It's, again, just sort of engaging, I think, a little bit more the student in the research process. I asked at the beginning for you to think about how will AI impact research? And the one thing I'm noticing already is it's pivoting us away from the keyword search strategy to prompts. And up at the top on this slide is, you know, how we're, we've all trained ourselves how to do this, right? We think up a lot of synonyms and then we use a bunch of Boolean operators and what a beautiful search this is. Unfortunately, that search does not work well in AI. Instead, AI wants us to converse with it. It wants to see the words in context. It wants to see a very good research question. It wants us to be clear and wants us to be specific. And you know, even like that, the question I have, the prompt on the bottom, what are some strategies for community college students with ADHD to improve their academic success? You'd think, wow, that's a lot to process, but that's what AI wants. That's what these tools want. And that's how they can respond well to us. There are two tools, one's called, I haven't looked at these, one's called ChatGPT Prompt Plus, and the other is called Superpower ChatGPT, and these are tools that keep track of your prompt history. So to me, that sends the message that prompts really matter. This is my last slide, and this slide I created using Bing AI Get Creative, and I asked for a female librarian in the world of AI, and it does not look like me, but I think she's kind of cool. And the reason I wanted to end with this slide is because I really want to remind you to how to reach out to us, our, the Phoenix College librarians. We are incredibly savvy searchers. We are very good at evaluating information. And as you can tell, evaluating is still a component of when you're doing research with AI tools. And we critically analyze information on a daily basis. This is our gig. This is what we do. So when you're exploring AI tools for your own research or with our students, reach out to us. You know, you can ask us what, which AI tool is the best for this particular task or reach out to us if you just want a colleague to talk about, I would love to revamp my research assignment or my class activity and integrate AI. Let's talk about that. We can teach your students how to effectively use AI tools in a responsible way.